A lot of joy with Bills Mafia right now. Six and two on the season, 31-10 win over the Seahawks. They have the struggling Miami Dolphins coming up next. Welcome to the Buffalo End Zone Podcast, everybody. Celebrity edition number three. We've had Chris McDonald on, aka Shooter McGavin, and Chad Michael Murray from One Tree Hill, both on. And now we bring in actor, writer, comedian, Buffalo native, and big Bills fan and big football fan. Nick Pakai from out west. Nick, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure having you on. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. I look forward to it, Kevin. So here we go, Nick. You're obviously from Buffalo. That's why you're a Bills fan. But as we do with these interviews here, take us into how you knew and really became a Bills fan back in the day as we kick things off. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, I played football like most kids growing up my age in Buffalo. And uh, I, my dad had a, a friend. I'm first generation. My dad is Hungarian. Um, my mom was Canadian. So there was no football culture in my home. But I, you know, I got into it. I loved playing it. And he had a friend, uh, Dr. Phillies, who had a share of a season ticket back at the old rock pile. Nice. So I would go with him. So I he started out, I cut my teeth on like Dennis Shaw and uh, OJ, you know, and Saban and that era. Um, and uh, sort of watching some of those, those rough early in, you know, the, the, that was not a great era of Bill's football, but I loved it. And that's where I started watching Bill's games and, you know, it just got in my blood, like most Buffalonians. I've never, you know, just never miss a game, never, never fell off the wagon. So it's been, uh, I've just ridden this all the way through. That's awesome, Nick. Now, I've known you for a while from NFL pregame shows. I mean, going way back to stuff on ESPN, you've done stuff on NFL Network, writing as well for NFL.com, and I think page two when that was a thing yep. on ESPN. <laughs> nice. That's how yeah. I, like, I know you from Tale of the Tape. I remember sitting there waiting for your segments to come on back in the day. So it's really cool for me to get to sit here and talk to you. But a lot of people around the newsroom, including Jordan, who was just in your ear, said, give me something else I might know Nick Pakai from. And I said, Salem the Cat from Sabrina the Teenage Witch. So we have Salem yeah. the Cat with Halloween just around the corner. The black cat, the witch, stuck in a cat's body. Nick, so yeah. is is that what you're most recognized for? I mean, I know you honestly from all the stuff you've done around yeah. NFL segments. But even my mom, my mom was like, give me something. And I mentioned Sabrina the Teenage <laughs> Witch. And she's like, oh, I know that voice, which is really cool. Yeah. It really, it probably is, you know, it depends on who you talk to, you know, I mean, you know, those, those, it was really the nineties and, and, you know, early two thousands when I was doing a lot of that stuff, I guess nineties through like 2010 hardcore mm -hmm. between Sabrina and my sports stuff. And you know what? It's like back then it was not quite as, you know, explosive a media world we lived in. And it's just all demographics, Kevin. You know, if you ask women of a certain generation, it's Sabrina, mm -hmm. you know, they, and that show owned uh, girls, not just in America, you know, internationally too. If you were a girl in the nineties between the age of, you know, five and, and you know, even into early twenties, because a lot of girls used to have that, show on when they were putting their makeup on to go hit the town, you know, and it was like, that is the thing. But if you talk to men of that era, it's ESPN. So I, and, and ESPN owned that demographic and they're very disparate, you know, so it really depends. It really depends on who I'm talking to. That's such a balance right there to me to have both of those groups know you from different. So at the end of the day, everyone knows Nick Bakai. In one way they, or the they, other. Every, everyone used to. Yeah. <laughs> Put it that way. <laughs> We've had a lot of. Now, if I'm primarily right, you know, and nobody knows who writes anything. So, you know, now now I'm in my anonymous years, and that's fine, too. 
I know we've been watching the uh, bookie show. My wife and I started watching it a few weeks ago. We'll get into that in a little bit. We also keep Seinfeld on a loop when we go to sleep at night. And that's one of the things that I keep saying, yes, Nick was Elaine's boyfriend in the smelly Mm -hmm. car episode (laughs) where Elaine couldn't get that sink off. And every time that episode comes on, it's hard to think Elaine could smell bad. But you did a you did a great job in that. Did I sell it? Good. You yeah, sold no, it, it to me. To act too. She's very <laughs> lovely. So it was all acting. I promise. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. That. You know. That. That was fun. That was back when I was doing much more acting too. And uh, that was great because being on that show, you feel like you know you. That was like you know. Oh, I'm on an episode of you know the honeymooners or something. Mm-hmm. It was like you feel like that one's never going to not be on TV somewhere. Right. Um, so that was pretty cool. That was really cool. Yeah, that was fun. Those are the days. All right. I got a little sidetrack there. Let's get to the current Buffalo Bills right now, Nick. Looking good. Um, yeah. Sitting at six and two and really in control of the AFC East. But I think for me, and I know this is a Buffalo Bills podcast, they look mm-hmm. like they're turning into one of the better teams in the NFL. Yeah, the Chiefs are undefeated still, but I think that's a that's going to change right quick if they start playing some decent teams. But I think the Bills are on track with what they've done as far as bringing in Mari Cooper and slowly developing this offense with these new weapons. I agree with you. You know, it, I feel like, you know, it's fascinating. You say we're, we've got a sort of stranglehold on the East. And as of this week, it's really <clears throat> something seeing us with six wins and everyone else at two. Um, because you, heading into this year, everybody was picking the Jets or the Dolphins. This is the year. Someone's going to knock the Bills off after all these losses of free agents and digs and all that. And I think Bills fans looked at it and thought, you know, uh, maybe the digs is addition by subtraction, you know, given how psychotic he was becoming and what that might have been like in the clubhouse. But I don't know what, you know, we, we were the big front runner last year and everybody at Buffalo knows that's not a comfortable zone for us. <laughs> so the fact that we were turning into an afterthought and like, you know, they thought like Tua and Aaron Rodgers, this is the year they're going to knock us down. That's perfect for us. But on top of that, like you alluded to, I think that between Bean and McDermott, they've done a remarkable job this year. They brought like a, we thought, oh, we're going to do without those safeties. Well, the secondary has been coached up beautifully. Um, You know, there's talk of Hyde maybe coming back, but we're not in any crisis. Uh, I think the defense has handled a slew of injuries way better than any of us expected. Uh, and this Cooper pickup, I think, was brilliant because it's made all the uh, other members of the receiving core. They're now slotted into the proper pecking order. And what we saw happen with Shakir, we all knew was going to come in and have a great year. He was poised to either in trust, but it's unlocked Coleman. It's unlocked Shakir. And I think that it's going to slowly, increasingly unlock Kincaid. Um, and boy, the, the, our running game has, and the line, this new line, it's a, it's a big bullying run blocking line. We're so balanced. I, of course, I'm a Bills fan and I'm completely biased. But look, <laughs> it's a bit. It's a Bills podcast. We don't have to pull our punches. And look, they look great. And Kansas City, you know, until we do something with them in the playoffs, they 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 have all the bragging rights. But you know, they, they they're winning in the most unimpressive fashion. They're the hollowest undefeated team I've seen in a while. It's got to come down around them at some point, and they keep losing key people too. Uh, we'll see what they pick up. I know they got Hopkins after Rice went down. We'll see if that has any galvanizing effect. But um, you know, they're, they're the sorry. I know you. You know, you might have those New England roots, but they're you know Mahomes <laughs> and and Mahomes and Andy Reid are our new you know Belichick and Brady. They are the they are the boogeyman, and you know this might be the year that we finally put a dagger in them. Beautiful. Well, let me ask you this, Nick, um, because my cohort, who normally co- co-hosts the show with me, he's a Buffalo native. I am not. I ask him on a regular basis as the Chiefs keep going, which one is the more hated dynasty than as a true diehard Bills fan? Is it what the Patriots did when you had a bad team 
or is it what the Chiefs are doing now when you have a team that can compete with them but just can't get past them? And he still says it will always be Bill Belichick, Tom Brady, and the New England Patriots because of the era he grew up in and, and all that. But I want to know, if, I've heard you talk before about your hatred of the Patriots. Yeah. Are they more hated than the Chiefs <laughs> dynasty right now? Uh, I think they are. They just, there's so much more history, you know. And, you know, look, the Chiefs' problems are Bill's problems. You know, the one thing that we don't know, as good as things have gone in this generation, in this Josh Allen era, we have never been particularly good at end-of-game management. And that's the thing that's always – it's the current scary thing about this team as much as Josh's brilliance is, you know, not this year, up until now, that has come with, you know, the price you pay for having the most exciting quarterback is there are going to be some pretty rough moments where mistakes happen and they, they're going to put you on the edge of your seat and maybe cost us a win here and there. But we've we've really thrown some games away with terrible coaching decisions at the end of these games – Every Bills fan knows which ones. And that's 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 an ongoing worry, you know, and I don't understand why it keeps happening. Because there is literally in a in, you know, I am you know, I'm a member of the writers guild. We struck to avoid being replaced by AI and I don't know if that'll ever work and we have really succeeded or not. But I will tell you that there are algorithms and there are formulas they can tell you what the hell to do at the end of games and situations. So there's really no excuse for screwing these things up the way we do. Um, so, and you know, when, when every fan could watch these things, I mean, you know, I was watching, um, you know, I watched the cut downs, the games on YouTube. I got the package and you watch these guys not take timeouts at the end of the games. It's not just our situation. There's bad end of game management all over the NFL. And it's inexcusable because that's your job, brother, you know, mm -hmm. um, I know in my line of work, if you keep making those kinds of mistakes, it is not for long, not for long league. It's just, you, you, this is, you know, you lose games that your players just won for you. That's murder. So I worry about that stuff. But, you know, for me, the Patriots just, you know, I'm old enough. Like I said, I go back to the rock pile. I still hate the Dolphins. The Dolphins yeah. have fallen away as our hated team. But we lost the whole decade of the 70s to them, the entire decade, two games a year. And Don Shula being on the competition committee and always getting the calls, not that they needed them, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, and, and winning all those Super Bowls, wearing shorts and hot weather on the sideline, everything about it, I still hate it so much as only you can hate things when you're a kid, you know. So for me, you know, it's, it's still Miami. Yeah. And then the Patriots. And, you know, Kansas City's making their moves. And when I see these commercials with Mahomes and Reed, and, you know, reads their drawn mustaches on guys on airplanes. <laughs> and all I look at is like, how is this guy getting a national campaign after his drunk kid just brain damaged a little girl? You know, I'm like, what, what world am I living in? You know, where, uh, you know, where everybody's getting canceled except Andy Reid. He's hitting, raised the two worst children in the history of the free world. But everybody loves Andy. Have another chicken McNugget, you fat. <laughs> hate him. I hate that guy you and do I can't believe hate he's the getting, chiefs i hate them and i can't believe they're getting ads you know why is andy reed getting an ad after the you know i guess he's a good football coach he's the worst father ever are we celebrating this i don't like it sorry you caught me too, um, too much i should have asked i should have asked about the profanity situation before. what's done is done <laughs> it's youtube but i don't i don't know nick how this goes but what's done is done right. at this point um, Aren't you we glad talk I'm on now. <laughs> we talk about Chiefs, Patriots, talk about the league right now. One of the big things that keeps coming up, and you can F bomb these guys too, because everyone is, is the current officiating in the NFL has become mm -hmm. absurd. Every year I say yeah. this can't get any worse. It's like the Bills last two games, there's over twenty penalties accepted or some obnoxious stat like that and you don't nick when you sit there and you watch a bills game doesn't your eye look down to the corner to see if the flag marker just pops up on the little score banner after every play it's obnoxious and it's Absolutely. not a fun way I, to watch football 
I got a good buddy who's a, from Pittsburgh. He's a Steeler fan. I was with him at his house watching the game last night with the Giants, Steelers, Giants, and it was. There were so many flags in that game that it was just it just ruined the experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, admittedly, a fair number of those were our old friend Brian Dayball fielding a pretty incompetent <laughs> football team, which is too bad because you know we have love for him in Buffalo, but he's um, from at here. any rate. He, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's he's blood, <laughs> but you know that just you know we saw that and that that ref he he was sort of Halloween themed. He looks like someone drained his blood. Whoever the main ref was on Monday, he was sort of a haunted figure. But we saw more of him than we did, um, you know, than we did Russ Wilson last night. It's it's just not entertaining, and you know, you cannot be of my generation and uh, and live with the roughing the passer situation now. I mean, they yeah. breathe on a guy. And I'm all for protecting quarterbacks. You don't want these guys. These guys are your marquee players. I get it. You know, nobody wants to see the great quarterbacks go down. And, and, and But I do think there's 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 got to be some middle ground. Because if you're playing defensive line in this era, why would you? Why would If you had a kid right now, the one thing you would tell them is don't, don't grow up to be – a pass rushing defensive lineman because it's a fool's errand now. Yeah, totally. 100%. I mean, I just can't, it, it drives me nuts. You're right about protecting the quarterback and whatnot. And you know, if Josh Allen embellishes and gets the bills a little help, I think we're all good with that, but. Well, look, ho hockey knows how to take care of that. You know, yeah. just take a page from hockey you know, when a guy flops, that's a penalty. They should, they might want to look at that in the NFL as well, right? I've heard you uh, on another podcast mention to, you have Josh Allen right now, just let it rip, let him do what he wants. But the Bills, Nick, have a very balanced team right now, run and pass. I think we're equal against the Seahawks. And I think at this stage, I think the podcast I'm referring to was from like a year ago or something like that yeah. when Allen was throwing all these interceptions. But I think they have yeah. a championship-style team with this balance in preserving Allen and telling Allen a little more mature, knows to throw the ball out of bounds instead of just throwing it down the middle. I like seeing it. Do you? Yeah, I agree with you. It feels like he there's been some sort of – leap in maturity this season, you know, because that was a reaction to last year. And there was that transition when Brady took over as coordinator right. and it was a good move. It's looking like a very good move, but you know, when that stuff happens in the middle of the season, everything's kind of at odds and sods. And there was a period of time where you thought it's too cautious. You know, the, I think we're getting killed with caution. We have this unicorn quarterback and we're kind of, you know, telling him to play half of his game. Right. Uh, I don't have any of those emotions watching it this year because I love what they're doing. And they, and they have the balance, but the running game is worthy of that now. Mm -hmm. And part of that is the line. It's, you know, it's not just the scheme. It's that they, you know, they, they made some tweaks to that offensive line that have been just profoundly effective. Um, you watch what Cook and then what Ray's doing when he hops in there. It's beautiful. Um, like you, like you're saying, you know, we, you, you can't load up on against this offense because you get killed. Um, there isn't one weak element of this offense. We've got great tight ends. We've got great wide receivers now that are balanced because Cooper unlocked everyone. No one's trying to be a number one anymore. And yet you can't, you can't load the box on any of those guys. And then the, you know, the running game has really been fascinating. And now that Ray's playing, you know, he's added this other flavor, and he's that little bullback. They can't see him behind the blocking, and then he's gone, and then he punishes you. And it seems to set Cook up beautifully. It's fun football to watch. And Josh, you know, he finally threw an, an interception. It's remarkable. That's not the Josh we know either. Yeah, and he, he pointed out, and I mean, if you saw the game, wet field, Amari Cooper slipped. Maybe mm -hmm. something happened when Josh Allen saw it, but it was too late. Uh, but it was inevitable. I mean, I do a post-game show with Stevie Johnson, the Bills' former wide receiver. Sure. And yeah. we were joking around like, everyone was talking about it too much. You could say it's not like a pitcher with a no-hitter. But Josh yeah. Allen was going to throw a pick eventually. 
Okay, it's out of the way. This cannot be a storyline anymore. Almost, almost better. Yeah, and right. it's, it didn't hurt us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. That's I love, great. I love your point about Stefan Diggs. I said that throughout the entire off season. Sometimes, what you don't get or don't have ends up being the blessing. And I always refer to the Red Sox not getting Alex Rodriguez and him going to the Yankees. Red Sox break the curse that year, win the World Series. The whole talk was the Yankees did it to the Red Sox again. They undercut the Red Sox and took Alex Rodriguez. But sometimes how these storylines in sports work out is Diggs, who I think I just saw online is done for the season. Um, Oh, is that a fact? I know he was hurt. Is he out? He hurt his knee, non-contact, right before we came on. I'm not going to give it too much credit because it was just something that flashed on my screen Mm -hmm. before. Interesting. But moving on from him, I think, ends up being good. And I think... Well, anybody who watched watched the Bills down the stretch, the last eight games, he didn't do much. You know, he really did nothing. And, you know, we don't play. We don't know the schemes. So we don't know. There's a lot of inside baseball we're not privy to. But... That's not a guy you. That's not a guy commensurate with the whining and the narcissism. But the fact that they paid him that much money just to go away, right? You that's, know, that's I, a- I'm in a business. I'm in. I'm in one of the few other lines of work where that kind of thing happens. And you know, it's, it's you really you gotta you you earn that kind of walk away money and you don't earn it being everybody's <laughs> favorite human being enough said you know right i my mean my god my god you and i might want to think about it right <laughs> <laughs> we're too nice obviously working in the media we were led to believe that everything was all hunky dory with Stefan Diggs going into they handled it going they into handled the it beautifully so i'm yeah. hanging out with some friends of mine in one of these little 12-year-olds comes up to me with his phone and goes, uh, I'm seeing that Stefan Diggs is going to get traded. And I say to the kid, there's no way in hell that's going to happen. I, I'm around the team. You can trust me. I'm around the team all the time. It might be a little rough right now, but everything's going to be fine. And then soon after they moved Diggs, I was around those people again, and this kid could not wait to come up to me, Nick, and stick it in my face that scoop. me, the guy who's with the Bills all the time, scooped by a 10-year-old, and he loved every minute of it, and I'll never live that down, but that's fine. No, that's, I'll give one to the kid. That's the, that's the world we're in now, right? Yeah. But that's, you know, and, and didn't you have that same thought balloon when you realized that he was telling you a real story that, you know, that wasn't your first thought out of the – Texans sure they want to do that to Stroud as a second year quarterback. Yeah, and you know, it looked they like they really want to expose his head to that game. It's interesting. He was a he, I mean, injured or not, you don't want to see someone get injured, but it seemed to me from watching them from up here, he was kind of even worse once he got down there, picking fights in Green Bay, screaming on the sidelines. I know he did a little bit yeah. of that here, but I don't know. Yeah, I think they thought they were going to get that, you know, um, first or second year digs, who's, you know, all about, you know, this is what I wanted all along and I'm happy for five seconds. But, I, I, you know, it seems like maybe he's beyond that now. But here we are. He served his purpose know. for Josh Allen. I'll say that much. You know, he, he did. And it's not to speak, not to throw him completely under the bus because it was glorious for a while there. But. You know, then then it really seemed to be like, you know, oh, I think it's like you're watching your kid have a crazy girlfriend. <laughs> That's a good point. Like, I like that. Can't wait. I can't wait for him to break up with her because I think he's <laughs> I think he can do better. You know. Uh, all right. Before we start to head out, let's go through some of the early years. Let's go through the 90s. You're now doing stuff with the NFL, and the Bills start to catch heat. What was that like for you during that time? You know, all of it was amazing because, you know, I was starting to have access and not just to events and to, you know, the machine of ESPN but and players, but also got to have such a great outlet for the kind of sports material I always thought there was a place for. Um, you know, when I came up in that world, 
sports comedy was essentially either Marv Albert doing bloopers on Letterman, which right. was fun. I loved know? it. Or it was great. I did too. Or, you know, it was like them, like Jay Johnstone giving people hot foots in the dugout. Right. Remember that? Right. Yeah. You know, it was like there really was no, no, nothing sort of satirical or football follies or... videotapes were always good. There you go. And again, it's bloopers. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's 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 Jim Marshall returning the kick the wrong direction for 30 years. So um, <laughs> the fact that there was an outlet, you know, for something that had a leather level to it was you know, something I always thought was potentially viable. And then, you know, in the era where there's a 24 hour sports network, it's like, yeah, I think you could probably squeeze three minutes a day in here that isn't entirely sober and you know, fact driven and earnest. So, uh, and, and I couldn't believe I got access and, and they, they turned me loose and I had at the time of my life. To this day, Nick, if I'm talking to my friends about a game, that's a push. I always, you, you can't help but say advantage push. Like with push. anything, when you hear that word, like that is stuck with me forever, which I love. <laughs> Blue. Yeah, imagine yeah, that's you know that, that really did work. It's funny how these things you try them and some of them don't, but that one stuck the tail of the tape and just comparing strange things. And if an advantage was a tie, it was the best thing in the world, yeah, because it was advantage push, <laughs> no winners, still here. sticks yeah. in your head. Flutie Rob Johnson, <laughs> what, what was your thoughts on how Flutie? Because okay, so growing up in Boston, <laughs> like we loved Doug Flutie. Years ago. We loved yeah. Doug Flutie, so the Patriots stunk. I think everyone I knew in Boston was a Bills fan the year Doug Flutie was here, and just heartbroken <laughs> when he got pulled. Yeah, you know, I, it's funny. I have to go in the wayback machine to remember that era. You know, it's it's um, obviously Flutie's that guy that no one ever wanted to give him his due as just sort of a a winner and rob johnson was that guy who's like you know you know he, he was sort of like if they drew a quarterback up in the blueprint room mm -hmm. you'd get that guy but <clears throat> you know as all is said and done rob johnson's career feels like it was about two seconds long right you know and he had he had a moment and he cashed it in good for him but not great for us. Whereas Flutie just, <laughs> it's just, there's no quit in Flutie. No matter what, man, he played everywhere, right? He just, he never stopped playing football, no matter what they threw at him or no matter how humiliating. It's like, go to Canada, you know, do the, you know, Flutie just kept rocking and rolling. And I think at the end of the day, the, the college career is unassailably brilliant. Mm -hmm. The pro career is strange and yet, it's a little bit like, you know, all the respect the Bills finally got for not winning, but just getting to four straight Super Bowls. All of a sudden, you start seeing all those guys hit the Hall of Fame when they did. Yeah. Even Marv. Even Marv, right? And um, That's when I know, started the covering the Bills there? is Rob Johnson's first year go. as a starter. So they win three games my first year out here. I thought I was coming out to cover a Super Bowl contender, so – that early yeah. on part of my career was going to the Hall of Fame to cover yeah. the early guys those, going into the Hall of Fame. Those inductions. You know, I feel like Flutie's pro career, has. we now look back on it and go, you know, uh, I don't know what it all amounted to, but just for gumption and, and longevity, and, and this is a small human being. I've met Flutie. You've met Flutie. You know, the, you meet him and you go, how did this guy play pro football on any level for two years, let alone decades, right? Um, and you know how football players are. They see somebody that small, they don't go like, hey, I'm gonna, let me pump the brakes. They go like, great, I can turn this guy into yeah. pate, right? <laughs> so he's a miracle. He's an amazing guy. My claim to fame is I beat Doug Flutie by three seconds in the Boston Marathon back wow. in 2015. People get annoyed out here that I bring it up, but I'm rather proud of that. The guy from Lord That's of the Rings good. crushed us both, but you just happen to look down at who was running in it and uh, happen to see that. Let's talk about Bookie on Max. Yeah. Uh, Nick, in the history of gambling and where we are now, I mean, I, I look back at, uh, you probably recall these, the football cards 
where that had mm-hmm. each game on it, and you circled, mm-hmm. gave it to, I think my grandfather for a buck, and then he yeah. would let me know if I won or not. Can't remember yeah. if I ever did, but that's my first remembrance of I think, what I think that's was. how everybody tip, dips their toe you know at school or at a factory or at work and you know those cards yeah that's sort of the introduction to the point spread um but you know they, they yeah rookie is you know I, I'm very proud of it we uh, we had a really good first season and we had an even better second season that shot and done and will premiere on max december 12 oh awesome highly recommend so you can go watch season one it's eight episodes it stars sebastian maniscalco who is one of the biggest uh, stand-up comedians in the world right now and omar dorsey and a ridiculously good cast and um i I love that ray romano was in the first scene like ray romano the second the show starts season two Oh, okay. Yeah. You can hear. Yeah. I turned to my wife, and I'm like, "That's Ray Romano," and it was you just know that voice. Yeah, it was just so yeah. perfect the way the show started. I loved it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, you know, we thought this is an interesting choice that we're not actually opening with our star, but we're opening with somebody you could say is iconic. But it worked like a charm for us. Um, but we had a blast, and you know, it's a story of a bookie out here in LA where it is still not legal to bet on sports in California. Oh, I wasn't, I guess so, I wasn't aware of that while I was watching. Yeah. So, you know, in a way he's like a dinosaur facing the, you know, eclipse event. Although anybody who knows the world of gambling knows that those guys have not been put out of business at all by the legal framework, but it changes things, but it's a guy, you know, with a family and a life and friends and complicated relationships who happens to be in the line of work of, booking bets for a living and um he and his partner who omar dorsey plays is wonderful and uh and it has boy i've never had more fun writing anything it's the closest thing i can say to what i would have done uh on my you know i did create it with chuck lorry which is a beautiful thing you want to do a show that's the guy and we had more fun writing this show and you know we sort of think of it as a little bit like elmore leonard comedy um, so it's sort of comedy and crime light and, I, but it, I think it's a, I think it's a true comedy and, um, you know, I think it's, uh, something that, you know, if, if you, if you, if you like sports, if you bet on sports, there's a lot in here for you, but I think anybody who's a guy just trying to get by, um, you know, look, everybody's career is on the verge of these eclipse events. You know, if you were a guy who had a taxi medallion and Uber came along or, you're in the hotel business and Airbnb, you know, we wake up every morning and there's some new device, media, algorithm, something that's trying to replace what you do. Um, so there's a lot of relatability in this show beyond the, you know, the eye candy of the immediacy right. of sports bookies in their world. Maniscalco's great. The writing's great. Oh, um, thank you. I just... Like watching it, the balance you said, crime light. I think the balance between comedy and some of the, uh, I, I won't get, I mean, if you saw it, you saw it. Or the gunplay, the violence, the, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the and death. So, we, there's some surprises. Yeah, there's, yeah they we, catch we, you off we, guard. We game, we game of Thrones you a little bit. People right. die you might not expect. Yeah. Right, it's right, fun. right. Oh, God, that was half the fun of doing it, brother. You know, we were like, oh, this is not a sitcom with a living room. You know, I mean, you know let's kill this guy. Why not? Ha, ha, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. Uh, I We like to pick the games coming up uh, before we head out on the podcast. My dad sure. usually listens to me and then texts me all game long that no one's hitting the over. Can't Josh Allen do one more thing? You said on your podcast right. this. Maybe you can do a better job than me. Bills minus six at home against the Dolphins. I think this is another. I mean, Josh Allen owns the Dolphins. I think minus six is pretty low or high or whatever it's supposed to be. I think it's with it's, ease. It, I think that, you know, it's funny. Right now, the two teams that are covering, no matter how much 
how high the chalk is they are as a favorite is are the Bills and uh, Detroit. Detroit covers Detroit covered eleven and a half last week. Mm-hmm. It was up to thirteen at kickoff. They covered with ease, <laughs> um, so that's something to keep an eye on. I, I I think the Bills are a decent bet at six. I think they're a really good teaser bet. You know, if you're into this sort of thing, yeah. If you're looking at a two a two team six point teaser, I'd look at the rest of the card and see who else you like. But the, if you could tease the Bills down with another strong favorite in that point range as long as you're at pick them or under three is what you always look at for teasers if it's you know you never want to be on threes sevens tens but if you can get under these key numbers but tease those bills up with something or a total you love and go over under it's this beautiful bet over I think under that, um, sitting at 50 nick i don't know i'm that on, I'm on bet that mgm by the way just so we okay all right, you know what else? Uh, let's find something else to tease it with. Who else is? Uh, who else? Give me some other lines from this week. I'm gonna have to look that up. Uh, <laughs> bah, bah, bah. Just to put everyone, just to uh, you know what? I actually had some games I was looking at earlier. Imagine that. Um, <laughs> what was I thinking? I had some thoughts here when I was supposed to be writing. <laughs> Do you have the over under at fifty for this? Oh, here we go. Go ahead. Here we go. You know what? Let's see here. You've got. Hmm. The ones I loved aren't great teaser numbers. Um. You could tease the Texans up there at the Jets if you really hate the Jets. Dumb. Um, You know that wouldn't be a bad tease. Um, here's another interesting one. You could tease the Eagles down to minus one hosting Jacksonville. That's not bad tease. Tease Philly and the Bills. Done and done. Okay, yeah. Nick, thank you for joining us. Uh, again, bookie on Max right now. Season one is out. You can watch that in its entirety. And then season two coming out in December. As they say, go Bills, Nick. We look forward to this weekend's game with the Dolphins. That's Thanks it. Thanks for joining us. You know what? I got to close with this. Here's what we were all talking about. Talking proud, baby. Nice. Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that great? Oh, I love yeah, it. That's my most cherished <laughs> gift in my office. Somebody found me an old talking proud poster. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thanks, Nick. And everyone, thanks for joining us. We'll see you after the game coming up on Sunday.